Okay, Luke, uh, another week, and let's do another response to the questions of fine tuning that we mm -hmm. discussed in our book. Do you have a copy handy? Oh, I do. Yes, How yes. convenient. Yes, there a we go. Fortunate universe. Where, where we're talking about the, the properties of our universe and how they appear to be fine tuned for the uh, existence of complexity and then ultimately life in the universe. Mm -hmm. And of course, everyone wants to talk about the life aspect, right? I mean, yep. the, the, you know, this gets wrapped up in the anthropic principle and, you know, which is centered around humans, all this kind of stuff. But people say to us, how can you talk about our universe being hospitable for life when so much of it is actually inhospitable? How can yeah. we say that we live in a hospitable universe? One of the ways I like to think about fine tuning is there's that quote, if you go traveling around the world, when you arrive back in your hometown, you'll see it in a completely new way, a completely different way. And so, sure, if you took a tour around our universe, a, a lot of it's empty space and there's no, there's probably not going to be life there because there's just not enough stuff to stick together to make anything interesting. And there's an awful lot of places that you, you couldn't have life even where there is stuff. So there's black holes, no good. There's uh, neutron stars where everything's been crushed into just a ball of neutrons. So there's no structure there that's that's sort of interesting enough or complex enough to hold like information in a in the sort of sense that DNA holds information. Certainly no one's had an idea about how you could do that. Uh, there's, there's stars which are really hot so that there can't be any chemistry. There can't be much chemistry in stars or, you know, uh, so you can't build stuff because the, the heat just sort of destroys it. And so looking around, you do find obviously places like here, which are awfully nice, but you might be struck by how inhospitable most of the universes are until you go on that tour around not just our universe, but the other ways the universe could have been. And a systematic way of doing that which, which sort of samples a lot of different ways is to take these fundamental constants, like how heavy is an electron and how strong is gravity and that sort of stuff. And we, we using theoretical physics, we go on a tour around other ways the universe could have been if these fundamental constants had been different. And what we find in those universes, uh, it makes our universe look like, you know, the, the coziest place in the world, uh, so to speak, because there's universes where it's only basically empty space, even less empty, you know, even more empty, less, even less stuff than our universe. And there's universes where the whole universe is like the inside of a star for the entire history of the universe. And that lasts about five seconds. Uh, and there's universes where they're just born with black holes all over the place. And there aren't nice places like this. There aren't rocky planets. It's just, you take your choice. You're either in empty space or you fall into a black hole. And, you know, um, there are universes which are only neutrons. And so the only thing you can make out of them is not anything as interesting as chemistry, chemical reactions, periodic table, all that's gone. The only thing you can make, you could possibly make out of neutrons is either neutrons hanging around in empty space. In these universes, they don't decay into protons, right? Because these are different universes. Or if you got them together, they would just make a ball. And that's it. So again, empty space, single neutrons or a ball of neutrons. That's all the universe contains. Once you've had that tour, you then head back around to our universe. And yeah, lots of it is inhospitable, but the fact that a planet like this exists, the fact that it even could exist, now becomes a rather remarkable thing. And it's more interesting on, a, on that, why is the fundamental properties of our universe like this, it's more interesting that, that this kind of complexity can exist when you've seen so, so, so many other universes where it can't. Yeah, so, so I, one of the questions I get asked is, could the universe be more hospitable? Oh yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, uh, so people think that when we talk about um, the hospitable universe that we're somehow saying it's at a maximum of- Yeah. Yeah, Hos yeah, yeah. Hospi hospitality, hospitability. <laughs> yeah, that sounds wrong. Yeah, hospitability. Um, but that's not what we're claiming, right? It's just that we, we have conditions where there is some life. But what if we wanted to make the universe more hospitable? I mean, we, we, what if we filled empty space with, with air, right? Yeah. And then, then we could walk on the moon, right? Yeah. 
So one of the reasons why this gets complicated is often when we come to the conclusion that, that as we do in the book, that our universe is fine-tuned, almost always for life, what we really mean is fine-tuned for complexity that life relies on. And the reason for that is when we go look at this tour around other possible universes, we find many of them are really, really, really simple. So there's, there's not the whole periodic table, there's just the neutron, or there's just a hot you know, fireball for five seconds, or it's almost completely empty, nothing sticks to anything else. When we, if you wanna, so relative to those universes, our universe is really complex, which is why it's so hard to understand and why it takes a lot of science to understand it. If you wanna then say, how could we make the universe more hospitable, you're, you're not heading in the direction that fine tuning goes, which is all those really simple universes that we can understand. You're now heading into the even more complicated direction and that's hard to do. Yes. So the answer is we're not totally sure, but what we could try and think of is what if I take the conditions that seem to be doing very nicely for life around here and make those more widespread, as you said, let's fill the universe with air. Now, if you just do that, but don't change anything else, that's a disaster for the following reason. Um, in in uh, the theory of gravity, either Newton's theory or Einstein's theory, there's a relationship between the density of an object, how much stuff there is per unit volume, and a time scale. So you can take the, the gravitational constant, the strength of gravity and uh, density, and combine those, it's one over the square root of G rho, never mind. And you get a time scale out of that. Now, what's that time scale? Well, it depends the context you're in. Um, if there's a whole bunch of other forces around, the density of air in this room, there's a time scale there with gravity, but it doesn't actually matter because there's a whole bunch of other stuff around. But if you just had um, th this amount of air just out in the universe with nothing else around, and you then were, for whatever reason, able to ignore the, the pressure forces pushing out, that time scale is how much time would it take for this amount of air to collapse on itself under gravity? So one of the ways that you could make the pressure of the air in this room irrelevant is by making a cloud of gas so big that the pull of gravity just overwhelms the force of pressure. But that's what that time scale means. Um, in, a, in the case of an expanding universe, if you fill the entire universe with, say, the air in this room, uh, the time scale you would be getting is how much time does it take for um, the, the universe to expand to, say, double the size-ish, or to turn around its expansion, or do basically do something with the expansion. With air, that this that time scale turns out to be something like a day, right? Which on a on a universal time scale is a rather short period of time. So if you filled the universe with air, um, the amount of time it would take for something to collapse, say you know a big bunch of it just started collapsing, it would be about a day. So that's a highly unstable kind of thing. And if you just fill the whole universe with air, then the entire, either you're expanding fast enough that you, you need to, the universe to sort of double its size on the time scale of about a day. So it needs to be expanding really quickly. So that air won't stay as nice, this density breathable air for more than a day, or it's the, the amount of time for the universe to totally recollapse on itself. And you know, it, you, you've, you've made a universe which, which collapses. So this whole, how can I make a universe which is more hospitable to life thing? Yeah, it's entirely possible. It's just, it's not easy to work out whether um, it is possible, but a specific way to make the universe more hospitable because some rather obvious ways actually end up being a disaster. And you have to then think, oh, what if I turn gravity down a bit? Or what if I did the, uh, So you, now you're not just turning one dial. You've got to sort of, now you're fine tuning the dials again, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that we spoke about in the book is this uh, issue that uh, in our periodic table of elements, we have 92 natural elements, whatever it is, but we know that as well as the elements, there are isotopes. So yeah. the elements with different numbers of neutrons in them. And we tend to have, and this is very hand wavy, 
one stable kind of isotope and then either side you get isotopes which radioactively decay as you get further and further away from the stable one yeah there's this thing called the valley of stability when you look at the periodic table and isotopes yep and that is a balance between uh the strong force the weak force and electromagnetism mm -hmm. and so we, we spoke in the book that you could you could wipe out any stable elements whatsoever right so all atoms would decay and you yep. just end up with a simple universe again but we did ask that question about what if we broadened the value of stability yeah that's uh, instead of there being essentially one or two carbon isotopes that are 10 or 20 or 50 and of course yeah. an isotope the electrons basically do the same thing so to the outside it still looks like a carbon atom but when it joins to a molecule because it has more mass it alters the shape of the molecules so you end up with a much more complex a much richer potential molecular world and we basically said well what does this mean for life no <laughs> yeah does it does it make life harder because one carbon atom and another carbon atom have different masses and so you get different molecules or does it open more potentials mm. right can you do new things the same molecule with different carbon isotopes in there do you get different chemistry etc so i i think that's yet to be explored but it's a bit it's a big topic right you know molecular biology uh, and even molecules in in chemistry are an immense topic thinking about other molecules and what yeah. shapes they have etc that that is a very big topic to deal with so an, another one of my favorite examples is it, with a bit of a change to the fundamental constants you can make the energy scale for nuclear reactions to be very similar to the energy scale for chemical reactions so alchemy works mm -hmm. so suddenly with a bit of energy put into a system you could you know spark up a chemical reaction you can light a fire or you can fire up a nuclear reactor and so suddenly the sort of reactions that are available is not just all of the chemical reactions but also all of the nuclear reactions so your body if it needs some oxygen it could sort of breathe in some carbon and then smash it you know who knows um again that's a step towards things being much more complicated so those sorts of questions it's almost as if we sort of have to <laughs> we have to finish our universe and working out exactly how that works and then we can go on and answer those other ones whereas the usual fine-tuning questions because they make things so much simpler it's those are the easy cases they're almost the yeah. toy cases that we practice on uh, and so the fact that so many other universes are like that is, is the interesting fact about fine-tuning